welcome to another edition of Journey of Hope. Stories of people that have encountered some type of medical crisis, traumatic injury, an illness, or cancer. And they've gone on not only to be survivors, but thrivers. You know, the psalmist says, today is the day of the Lord. Let us be glad and rejoice. Every day is a new day. As we wake up in the morning, we have no idea what that day holds for us. Such was the case of our, of our guest today. Over five years ago, Tom and Dora woke up unexpecting what was going to be taking place in their lives that day. Our special guests are Tom and Dora Barilla from Rancho Cucamonga. Tom is a fireman, a paramedic, an engineer. Dora works here at Loma Linda University in the School of Public Health, has her doctorate, and has written a book that we're going to uh, learn more about and about their journey. But about five years ago, as they woke up, they had no idea that Tom was going to be involved in a horrific accident on Interstate 10. And we're going to learn their story and about their journey. So good to have you here with us. So tell us a little bit about your background, and then we're going to get into the story. But Dora, where are you from? Well, it's great to be here. I was originally born in Pasadena okay. and raised in South Pasadena and moved out to Rancho Cucamonga in 1990, 1991. 91. And Tom, where are you from? I'm originally from New York. Okay. And my father was transferred out here, so the whole family came out in 74. And then I was hired in the city of Upland in 1990. As a fireman? As a fireman. And then we both moved out to uh, Ranch Cucamonga in Okay, now, what did your father do? My father was a volunteer fireman for 28 years in Long Island, New York. And I understand you have a brother, at least one brother. I do. My brother Mike is a fire uh, captain in Pasadena, okay. California. And my little brother is a firefighter paramedic in the city of Phoenix, Arizona. Okay. Now, so you've been a fireman for many years and a paramedic. And uh, Dora, you've been working here at the, at the university, but begin to tell us what, this, what happened a few years ago. As you woke up in the morning, had no idea what was going to transpire. And for our listening audience, tell us what happened on that morning. Well, it was just a typical Tuesday morning, and I was actually driving out to Loma Linda and heard on the radio that there had been an accident involving a fire truck. And I called the station because I knew it was close to Tom's station and was informed that um, Tom had been involved in the accident and that they would be calling me back very briefly. Well, needless to say... So at that point, say, I mean, you didn't really know anything about it? Saw it on the news? No, I'd heard it on the morning radio, the morning traffic on, report. On the traffic report. As okay. I was pulling up to Nickel Hall here at Loma Linda and w was just absolutely blown away. And I received a phone call from one of the battalion chiefs that Tom had been in an accident and was airlifted to Arrowhead Regional Medical Center. It was the closest trauma center. And when I got there, basically, um, they weren't expecting Tom to live. They were preparing a widow for her husband to, to pass. And they gave him literally a 1% chance to live. He didn't have, um, he, his lungs had been crushed. His, they had performed a needle crike in the field, which is a last resort. Kind of a last emergency resort. Absolutely, and had he had experienced so much head trauma <coughs> that his head was so swollen, and um, they immediately went in and removed a part of his skull, and it was it was pretty and much. It was just to kind of relieve the pressure and everything. I mean, everything's probably swelling up. Right, a last uh, you know an attempt to relieve some of that pressure so the brain could swell, and um, then it was a, a sit and wait, and uh, we you know we were we were frightened for his life, for our family. And um, just to hear um, some of the pictures of um, the fire truck, you can see that clearly the <coughs> engine was absolutely demolished. I mean, as, I, as I've read the, some of the reports, it sounds like you were responding to some kind of an emergency. Was it a fire? It was a 
uh, traffic accident, traffic which is accident. more or less a routine type call. Sure. So you're you're going down Interstate uh, 10 and moving across the lanes. Traffic is kind of backing up from what I remember and what I remember reading, and you're moving from one lane to the other as traffic is you know seeing the lights and everything, and then you finally move over into the uh, uh, far lane, the fast lane, and it's my understanding that there was a tour bus coming doing about. 75 miles an hour yeah. that collided with the truck and you can see from the pictures here that it was a horrific accident so that's the way your morning starts <laughs> okay and yeah. you know things sometimes go from bad to worse but you know it's, it's probably like it's a nightmare that's happening at this time Absolutely. And, of course, Tom, we have to get you to tell some of the story here because Tom doesn't remember anything there for a couple of weeks, but he's apparently hovering. He's got a tremendous uh, uh, brain injury. Yeah. And so go ahead and tell us now. I mean, they really, it was touch and go. So for 72 hours, we, we started the prayer chain because there was nothing we could do. After they did the surgery, performed the surgery, it was, it was you know, wait and see if he's going to survive. Kind of moment by moment, hour by hour, and a minute by minute. Absolutely. Apparently. I mean, we every every hour they would do our neuro check to see if there was any response and, you know, just absolutely nothing. And um, about 48 hours into it, he finally gave a thumbs up when... Really? Yeah, they asked, you know, they were asking Trying to him, communicate with him. Trying to communicate, and we thought, okay, brain activity. Thank you, Lord. And, and then it progressed about 72 hours after they realized, okay, maybe he's not going to die, but... It took 72 hours even, to, but then nobody's sure, you know, is he exactly. going to live? Well, and if he does live, what's left? What is going to be down? His brain has been complete, I mean, basically in a blender. Yeah. He has been so badly injured, and his brain... Um, injury was so, you know, traumatic, traumatic. Brain oh, absolute traumatic. And um, so they did, he, he had actually fractured his entire face, lost all his teeth, had a fracture in his um, now, upper you, mouth. You have a picture of that? Yeah, we have a picture of what Tom, oh, excuse me, what Tom looked like. Um, this was about 10 days after the accident. So you could see, I mean, he wasn't looking pretty. His eyes were swollen shut. Um, this is when we actually got quite a bit of the blood off. Um, he was and, not... And had him cleaned up. I mean, yeah. it's an unbelievable photo. Tom, there's no resemblance. <laughs> You're a kind man. No resemblance. Uh. So, tell me, you know, what's going through? And you got a family. Now, you yeah. have some family around here. You had a couple of uh, daughters. Mm -hmm. We had two daughters, seven and ten. And what do you tell them? Yeah. You know, the, the hospital staff was advising us not to bring him in. I mean, the sight of Tom was making grown men cry, let alone bringing his 7-year-old and 10-year-old daughter into the room. And so we just asked them to pray. They wrote cards. We recorded messages for them. And um, it, it was just such a challenge to to be honest. I mean, obviously, sure. they needed to know. It was all well, over every daddy? newspaper. What's wrong yeah. with daddy? Can I see daddy? every newspaper, every news station. And um, about day 10, my 10-year-old my daughter, my daughter said to me, you know, Mom, you can't keep Daddy from me anymore. Oh, that's got to be tough. That hit me like a brick and actually got a little advice to that perhaps maybe they could, we could bring her in. And uh, someone, you know, I had a, a counselor from church say, but what if he does live, Dora? What a testimony that will be to your children. What a powerful testimony, yeah. And good, good point. So we prepared them and brought them in. It was actually Good Friday. Was it really? That we brought them in because he had just started responding uh, to, to questions. To questions and, and giving you signals that he could hear and understand and right. appropriately responding. Oh. Still had the trach, so he yeah. wasn't able to talk or whatnot. But... Um, you know, he was able to hand motion to the girls, and um, they, you know, we were afraid, is he going to know who we are? Oh, and, you know, with a brain injury like that, I mean, you're right. If he does make it, what then? Exactly. I mean, is it going to be Tom? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be somebody that we recognize, and we're going to be able to communicate with him? Will he recognize us? Absolutely. Yeah. 
what kind of damage has really been done. So all these questions are going through. And I, people were praying around the clock. Oh. Now tell me about your support system at this point. Well, we had, we had people praying. I mean, we, on the press conference, I asked his brother, Mike, to ask people to pray. And so not only did we have our personal network, but we used the media to ask people to pray. And it was just amazing, the outpour of prayer. I have a box that's probably four feet by, you know, six feet wide that um, is filled with cards of people saying, I prayed for your husband. Really? And that was just so powerful. And uh, it has changed from me across forever. the country. All over, yeah. all over. We had think of people from France. Oh, all over, around the world. Yeah, yeah, that had sent something saying that they were touched by the request to pray and that they prayed. And, um, and then the fire service is just an amazing community. They just came in and took care of us like you would not imagine. I didn't even open a door. And people that didn't know you, but that were firemen because you were part of the family. I mean, I've, I've read the story and I've talked to you know before, and it's just an amazing community it is. that came together during this time. I say if the, if the world was more like the fire service, it, it would be a different and better place. Oh, what, a, what a testimony to your profession. Well, yeah. Tom, tell us what, what you remember about this. Well, at this time, a lot of the uh, things that occurred, I was unconscious for. So what I, re what I recall was two days before the accident at my brother's house doing some fix-it things, which is typically what I you know, and he would do together. And then the next thing I remember is being told that I'm going to this hospital for rehabilitation. Well, I thought I was at home watching the television, and needless to say, I was in an ambulance being driven over to a rehabilitation hospital. So this two-week period that this was all going on, I had no recollection of, which in the end was an answered prayer, um, not to remember any of it. But when I started um, coming, coming back, from the place that I was, um, the questions that, that you would ask, will he still remember our wedding? Will he still remember the children's names? And, and I did. You know, it was, I mean, this, this it was a miracle. This is an amazing story. It is a miracle yeah. after miracle after miracle. So continue on. Um, from that point on, it was a slow <laughs> and arduous process of rehabilitation, physical, mental rehabilitation. Um, social mm -hmm. rehabilitation because at points in our our recovery you know the doctors would say so Tom uh, what are you gonna do when this is all over I'm looking around I'm, well I'm gonna go back to work and just the uh, jaw-dropping response didn't someone tell him he's never going back to work and so I grab hold of that and said that's I mean, did going people to actually verbalize that he right? It was verbalized, yeah, it was and it was just something that Didn't I... did somebody break the news that, you know, he's going to have to... This is gonna, it. He's not the same. He's not going to be able to go back to work. And so something that I have passion for and I have a family history of, that was, that was it. That was my uh, nail. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drive this in the piece of wood as long as I can because I, that, was, uh, that was something that you I could... You can't do it. You're not going back. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm choosing to carry on. And the people around me... Help support that. Did they? Absolutely. And I don't know if it was um, something that Dora did, but everyone around me was very positive. There was never talk of you can't, you will. Don't say that you can't because you're going to. Every interaction. Well, that wasn't by accident, was it, Dora? No. I. Um, if you look at the newspaper on Easter Sunday, it, the front page of the newspaper stated that um, the reco recovery was a miracle and that the wife was crediting faith for um, his recovery and his survival. And I think what this did was I, I just kept stating, you know what, we received a miracle and God's going to finish it. He's going to complete it. He's not going to stop now. So why would we not say he's going to go back to work and brought his paramedic protocols in for speech therapy and said he might not be able to do this today, but tomorrow he just might. And, you know, I had a rule that we would not say anything negative, that everything would be positive, and if they, you were going to be negative, um, you weren't going to work on my husband's case. <laughs> That's great. That's great. 
obviously it's had a profound impact. I mean, and you know, for our listening audience and those that are visiting loved ones and family in, in the hospital, we need to remember that even though they're not able to communicate and sometimes it look like they're completely unconscious, you know, there's that, the, they always can hear and understand. And we, we've heard the story of many people that come out of a coma that they're able to share some experiences mm -hmm. that they heard. Yeah. So you're getting positive feedback. And it was very encouraging and uplifting and it was almost a, you know, wings of angels that kept me going to the next level. And then when I had the opportunity to actually come back to work, actually sitting in the fire engine, now I became a little bit nervous because now's the true test. Because before that, I never wanted to be the weakest link and now I possibly could have been. So I had the people that nurtured me all through this process promise me. You have to promise me that if I'm deficient in something, you need to tell somebody. Okay, which so I, for our, excuse me for interrupting, but for our listening audience, I mean, you're talking about going back to work mm -hmm. as a fireman, as a paramedic, and you've suffered a traumatic brain injury. Now, so how long after the accident are we talking about? I mean, are we talking about a few years? It was a total of six months. Six months at, um, back to work and nine months full duty. Full duty. Without any restrictions We're or not any talking about cognition. a miracle. We're talking about a miracle after a miracle, miracle after a miracle. And the miracles are continuing on. Absolutely. And we're, we're talking about recovery. And recovery is not a single event. No. It's a process. And the physical Mm. Recovery was one thing, but my guess is that you know you had you were involved in all kinds of therapies. What kind of therapies were you involved in? Um, they would perform examinations. For example, they would say, uh, "We want to give you five numbers, and we want you to put them in chronological order." Are you ready? Oh, sure. Twenty-two, seventy-eight, five, thirty-four, <laughs> and and you would this would go on for hours. I believe they're MITSA exams, and then they would give you. Uh, a paragraph or a, a sentence and you'd have to put it in alphabetical order and to get the mind operating back to Reschedule, where... Reschedule, reprogrammed. Literally. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my, so you didn't pass with an A right to begin with. No. <laughs> and, and for me that was, you know, that's pretty tough because I, I'm very competitive. And you knew, you knew that you weren't able to respond the way they wanted you to respond. Because I needed to get back to this fire service, this job that I love because it helps me, it helps me be the person that I am and helps me. It's part of your identity. It is who I am. Yeah. And so I, you know, really had to struggle because some of the uh, recovery wasn't, wasn't good. Um, part of it, I started becoming, uh, I, I was getting more uh, paralysis on one side. So my recovery was actually getting worse. And in that, in that case, we met a neurologist who thankfully figured it all out and, and reassured me because one step back or one uh, setback can really, really end it. Can be devastating. It can be. And he was very reassuring, had an excellent bedside manner that you, you only get through experience of either receiving it or understanding it. And so he reassured me and from that point on we moved forward again. Well, I want to point out again to our audience that you know, you, the Lord can perform a miracle, but everything doesn't automatically fall into place. And it doesn't end the story. The story goes on, mm -hmm. and one miracle after another. And it sounds like in your story, as you're, you, as you're getting better, there were some times when you've actually got, you feel back. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the physical healing is one thing. Emotional healing is quite another thing. And that's the book that uh, you've written, Dora. And, you know, I, if people want to get a hold of this story, what do they do? Well, we have a website, a newdaybook.com. A new day book. Dot com. Dot com. Okay. And they can go online or they can go to any uh, Borders, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and um, any online service so to order. So this, this is the story. Now, the healing continues on. It's not a single event. And there were all kinds of healing that needed to take place. Absolutely. So tell us about it because, you know, you're praying for Tom to live. And then after it's obvious that he is going to live, tell us what's happening then with your thinking and your worries and your concerns. Well, I mean, after you realize he's going to live, then it's like, how are we going to make a living? Or is our relationship going to be the same? Or, you know, there's a lot, once the physical has happened, there's a lot of emotional healing that needs to take place. And that's when you really need to dig in and, and not, 
don't think you can walk away from God and right. and and He's there and be all okay. the time. Yeah, absolutely. And you need him even more, even after the physical healing, because then it was, well, what's the uh, emotional healing in our relationship? You know, there was a lot that you just you're dealing with because you're on an sure. adrenaline rush literally for months at a time. And there gets to a point where you need to say, wow, okay, now there's some um, additional healing that needs to take place in just our mind and our spirit and take the time to do that. And I think an important part of that was giving back to others, mm -hmm. talking with them in rehab, writing the book. I know Tom has his ways of giving back, but that has been an integral part of the healing process. Well, I would imagine that for nine months or whatever it was, you know, you're you're running the show with all of the rest of the family and friends and everything. And then Tom, little by little, comes back. That, right. that there had to be some some changes that had to take place there. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you you know, you're taking care of everything. I yes. mean, he couldn't, he was in a coma and you have to transition back to a relationship where you were, you know, basically I was the provider. I say it's yeah. like having, raising yeah. a child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we had to learn to teach him to eat and walk and think all the over again. Mm -hmm. And then it's like now we have to go back to normal. Oh, you can you really pay that bill? Can you really take every, care of the kids? <laughs> every everything was a test. And so did you remember to do this? And did you remember to do that? And so little by little I would try to take some of the responsibilities back because the way I was raised was you know, the man is the provider and the man takes care of things. Well now I was I was the recipient. I there was no, you know, how did you do this and how are you doing that? And the new the new uh, definition of courage and strength was my wife. Well, you know, um, the physical, but the mental can be just as difficult oh, exactly as right. uh, as a 50 yeah. pound or 100 pound weight, and and it and it changed daily because all these things that she would hold on to because I you know I need to be steadfast and and I need to be the one that in charge uh, and she was we would be in um, conferences and they would be asking her how I was doing. <laughs> which was was very uh, intelligent of him because she had a very um, acute ability to say, well, he might be lacking in this and might be lacking in that. And those are hard things to hear. Yeah. But getting back to the normal. Well, we have a new normal now. Mm -hmm. That's a good point, a new normal. Mm -hmm. That's right. And the healing continues on. Absolutely. It hasn't, it hasn't ended. It's a, it's a continuing, growing process. The story you've written in New Day is, is an amazing story. A story of miracle after miracle. Now, for our listening audience, there are people in the audience right now that just this week have encountered some kind of a, an illness, a, an injury, whatever it might be. What would you tell them? You know, I, I would tell them to, you know, think of three things that, for, well, actually multiple things, that if you have a loved one or a friend, don't discount the smallest act of kindness. It was that card, that smile, you know, that um, somebody just stopping by to say hi and giving me a hug. It wasn't the big things <laughs> always. The little things that are making a difference. Just to know that somebody cared. We had, uh, when Tom was in the hospital, actually some of the firefighters went and got sandwiches at the local sandwich shop. And the person ahead of the, in, ahead of the line paid for the sandwiches. And that was so touching. A very that, meaningful thing. It really, I mean, it brought healing in sure. a sense because, and, and I didn't know what was going to happen at that point. So don't discount community and the power of the, that support and how, what role that plays in the healing process. People, you don't, they don't need to be alone. Um, and I have a picture here of some of the firefighters that shaved their head the night before Tom's um, surgery. And um, it was just so touching. And it it's was a support. It was yeah, a, a simple support. gesture. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe not so simple for some people. Yeah. <laughs> they were all they were all guys, right. so it might have and been a little families. easier. Yeah. I mean, it's an outward sign of support, which, you know, it's a it's a tough choice sometimes. Well, you yeah. had a picture of, of a tree that uh, was kind of symbolic. We do. Yeah. Um, there, you know, in addition, but let, let me finish with that community. Sure. And just to hold on to your faith, and each day journal, and I journaled Tom's progress, 
and held on day to my day. faith. Held on to my faith. There was one night where I just was praying to God so profoundly to heal Tom. And I just, God, please heal Tom. Please heal Tom. And I remember I had this warmth come over me. And it was almost like God saying, Dora, stop asking God, stop asking me to heal Tom and start praising me. Oh, what important. For healing Tom. Yeah. And it was a shift and I, in my mindset and my faith that I was going to be grateful for whatever healing I got. Oh, that's or great. I received. We only got about a minute and a half here. Go ahead. Tell us about the tree. The tree, we, Tom and I went to the Sequoia National Forest after our, um, the, the summer after the accident. And this tree was there. And I to told Tom to take a picture because I thought it really resembled our lives. And this was one of the scriptures that I held on to. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And it was a, a, a physical representation that tragedy can hit your life. But on the other side of that tree, it grew stronger and more beautiful than on the other side. And, but that you might have a tragedy that comes along in your life. But if you persevere and stay close to God and stay positive, you can overcome. What a powerful symbol. Again, for our listening audience, I want to suggest you get a, this story of a new day, the story of Tom and, and uh, Dorella and the amazing miracle after miracle that has uh, taken place. For our listening audience, uh, you know, God has got a plan for each one of us. And sometimes the journey of life is kind of ups and downs, but God's always at work, as you've indicated time and time again. And the miracles continue. And for those of you that are looking on, uh, God's got a plan for your life. If you'll give him an opportunity, look up to him. He's waiting for you to come to him and put your trust in him. And remember, the psalmist says, today is the day of the Lord. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Every day is a wonderful opportunity. Until next week, so good to have you join us. Until that time, God bless you, each one. Thank you.